Hi, good afternoon. Uh, thanks for joining us for our family and community webinar for July. Um, and thank you, especially to those of you guys who are able to be here this week when we were originally scheduled for last week. Um, thanks for bearing with us with that delay. But uh, we'll go ahead and get right into it. So our topic today is uh, discussing halfway houses and transitional living. And so we'll mostly be focused on halfway houses, programming, um, how people go to halfway houses, and we're going to touch a little bit on recovery houses and sober living at the end before we um, kind of announce what our topic is going to be for August, which is a really good one um, by another presenter. So that's going to be um, exciting. So just our usual housekeeping reminders that um, we do have the Q&A box down at the bottom there. So if you have any questions as we're going through the slides, please pop them in there. And I do try to pay attention to it and answer any questions that might come up um, before we get to the end, but also take a look to make sure I didn't miss any once we get to the end of our slides. And as always, if you have any recommendations for topics that would be of interest, please go ahead and throw those in there as well. Um, it's been, I think, officially two years of doing the webinar, so um, definitely any topics that you are interested in would be well received. Okay, so our objectives for the afternoon are just to talk about what a halfway house is, who would benefit from a halfway house, a little bit about the placement process and any restrictions that might be present, talk a little bit about rules and conduct, benefits of a halfway house, and then we'll move over to sober living and recovery houses. There's different categories of those, so just touching on that a bit. And then talk a little bit about halfway houses compared to recovery houses just to wrap up with before we get to some resources and what our topic will be for next month. So a halfway house is a type of treatment that happens in a community setting. So it's still considered a residential treatment, but it is not as restrictive or intensive as like an inpatient rehabilitation program. It does have a 24 seven staff, but it tends to be in a more home like environment. So, you know, we're, we use the term halfway house because it's really that transition piece between the superstructured residential setting and ultimately working toward independent living. So while somebody's in treatment at the halfway house, they are working, of course, to still maintain their sobriety, um, still stabilizing and any many health, any mental health symptoms that might be going on, um, working to achieve employment connect with community resources and learn different responsibilities that they will need to be able to successfully live independently and also be able to balance being newly sober with those different kind of obligations. So treatment length can vary um, as all treatment lengths now based on somebody's progress rather than a fixed treatment length, but generally halfway house treatment is three to six months. Again, certainly can be longer um, if, if necessary. So in this too, of course, halfway house programs are going to differ from program to program, but I really tried to focus on common themes. Um, so take this with a, you know, take this with a grain of salt, but generally try to stick to something that would be applicable to most halfway houses. So it is a treatment environment for people who are usually transitioning out of a residential treatment setting or incarceration. Um, the incarceration 
halfway houses for incarceration can be considered a little bit differently. So today we're just sticking to um, substance use disorder halfway houses. There are also different kinds of halfway house programs. So they're typically separated by gender, um, a men's halfway house, a women's halfway house. There are some halfway house programs for women with children. And then there are some kind of specialized halfway house programs that can be more heavily faith based um, or have specific program components like a veterans program, um, a program for domestic violence and abuse recovery, um, Spanish speaking programs. Those are also kind of subsets of programs that are available depending on the program. So a little bit more about treatment focus. So we're working to allow people to be able to have that balance with their sobriety and different kind of life obligations. So a lot of the treatment is focused on personal responsibility and working toward increased freedoms um, and, and privileges within the program. So a lot of halfway house programs use um, different treatment phases and when somebody is progressing from, you know, to the next phase, they have demonstrated that they're doing well, they're making progress, um, and they can handle a bit more freedom to, to be out in the community, to be away from the facility for longer. Um, so it's really designed to help somebody move from more restrictive to less restrictive and ultimately have their own, um, their own living situation. Generally, halfway houses or halfway houses offer individual group and family therapy. Um, some have a component of medication management um, or are closely connected with somebody else in the community who can do medication management. And um, there's, of course, a psychoeducation piece to the, the groups that are being run and the programming. A lot of halfway houses require um, meeting attendance, a lot of times it can be 12 step meeting attendance or other sort of recovery meeting attendance. And that's usually offered on site or available in the community, especially if the halfway house is. You know, not in such a rural setting, there may be a, a good recovery community uh, with recovery resources in the community. So there can be a big focus on getting residents hooked up with the larger recovery community outside of the actual facility. So if we look at, there's kind of two components of halfway house programs. So there's the clinical services and then there's the recovery residence part. So again, there are counseling sessions, and it is no less than five hours per week. So that is helping people to continue to work on their motivation to be sober and to make the necessary changes that can help them stay sober, um, as well as generally improve their functioning, help them with coping skills, um, help them continue to work on impulse control, and just continuing to do some of the work that was started in a residential treatment setting or an inpatient treatment setting, excuse me. Um, offer medication management and education, offer mental health evaluation and treatment. So again, this is one that can really vary depending on the facility and whether they are a co-occurring program or not. Um, but at minimum, halfway house programs tend to be connected with mental health providers in the community um, if they don't have, you know, a psychiatrist on staff or something like that. Um, and again, other big components of the program are job skills development and placement and then life skills development or remediation. So working on things like 
developing a resume, practicing job interviewing skills, um, learning how to complete household chores, um, keeping a budget. Those are all components of um, life skills that could be touched on in, in the programming. And in terms of recovery residents, so halfway houses are staffed 24 hours a day, and it's really looking to provide the stability to ideally prevent relapse. Um, and a lot of that is done through drug screening um, when somebody is coming back into the facility. There is certainly a focus on interpersonal and group living skills because this is a an environment where there are, you know, lots of people recovering. So learning those kind of skills to navigate that environment. Typically, there are some sort of community or house meetings of residents or residents and staff to talk about any concerns to hold each other accountable, to support each other. Um, that's usually an aspect of the programming as well. And there tends to be an emphasis on building a sense of community within the halfway house. So, which that helps to reinforce different recovery concepts. Um, and again, serves as a bridge to the larger recovery community um, from the facility and gives folks practice at building supports and using them. So in terms of who would benefit from a halfway house, though so people need to meet a certain criteria to go to a halfway house, to be accepted to a halfway house. Um, and generally, that looks like what I have here. Um, anything with an asterisk is something that there's uh, kind of a twist to, but we'll get there. So generally somebody who is seeking to go to a halfway house still needs that 24 hour structure and accountability, but they are able to cope for little a little window of time so that they can go to work, um, and that they can manage that in limited doses at the beginning. Generally, those folks are relatively stable in terms of their physical health and mental health. Again, there are some programs that also address heavier mental health symptoms simultaneously, but that can really depend on the program. Uh, the person would benefit from additional coping skills or insight about their substance use. And um, it really seems like a residential treatment is the kind of treatment that's going to help achieve that rather than an outpatient treatment. And they recognize their, they have some sort of insight in terms of their substance use or their mental health, and they are generally fairly ready to change. So somebody could be less ready to change. Um, maybe they are mandated to a halfway house treatment. Um, and that piece is they would need a residential treatment to still work on developing that internal motivation. Um, and it seems unlikely that outpatient treatment would, would help them progress in terms of their motivation. And this is the biggest piece, but I had to split it on two, two slides. Um, the living environment is a really important piece for who is suitable for a halfway house. So generally anyone who has a living environment who would make it hard to be sober. So if somebody is homeless, certainly um, they would benefit from halfway house placement. If there are others at home who also are using substances, if there is a risk at home for abuse or, or there has been abuse at home and it is likely to continue, if somebody has a social network that has people that also use substances, deal substances, 
um, are involved in those kind of behaviors, or if somebody really isolates and withdraws, um, that person could benefit from a halfway house. And generally, if there's exposure to substances or like high availability of substances in the community, um, that could also be a factor that would kind of meet this criteria. And this bottom one is not, um, not necessarily a requirement, but it is something that some of the insurance companies ask about when we're asking about halfway house placement, and that is somebody who might need vocational, educational, or life skills. So maybe they um, don't have a diploma, but would like to work on their GED. Um, if they have been unemployed for a period of time, that may be something else that could, uh, another area that somebody would benefit from a halfway house program. So a little bit about the placement process. So a lot of, I want to say all, um, but I will say most halfway houses um, require that residents have first completed some sort of inpatient treatment and have the necessary stability to be successful in this kind of program. So, um, you know, they want to make sure that the physical health piece and the mental health pieces are able to be maintained at the halfway house level of care as opposed to inpatient where they're working on getting it more regulated in a lot of cases. Due to uh, demand of halfway house beds, it can be really important to start that process in the first couple weeks, if not the first couple of days of treatment, especially depending on the season. Um, winter time, it gets can be really dicey to find a bed um, in a timely manner sometimes. So starting early and applying broadly to different halfway houses can be really helpful with um, accepting, uh, being accepted and getting a bed. Some insurance companies, this is more rare, but some insurance companies do require that a, somebody is approved to go to a halfway house after treatment before any of this process is started. So that may be an additional step um, that somebody needs to go through is to kind of talk to the insurance first um, before they have any interviews or um, meet with a case manager. But again, that's that's certainly more rare. Um, then a person that's interested in halfway house placement will generally meet with a case manager or a designated person at the facility, and they will sign consents to send the information that the halfway house program is requesting. So that can be some of the screeners. Um, the history and physical is usually a common one that's sent, um, and that information can vary based on program as well. And then the halfway house will schedule an interview. They will generally ask questions about the person's motivation, um, any past periods of sobriety, what kind of goals they have and why they want to come to the halfway house, their history of substance use, and some other areas to make sure that they are a good fit for the program and that the program is a good fit for them. So there are some restrictions that different halfway house facilities have. Um, so they may, it may, they may have procedures that prevents them from accepting different people into the program based on certain needs they have or different presentations. So again, this is not across all halfway houses, but this can be some areas that folks run into that are seeking a halfway house. So some um, medication assisted treatment types are restricted at some halfway houses. So they may not, they may accept um, kind of the injectable forms of MAT, but not something that would need to be dosed every day. Um, 
a person that has diabetes that requires insulin to manage their diabetes um, may not be accepted into some facilities. And somebody that has a history of violent legal charges or violent behaviors um, is typically pretty hard to place in a halfway house. Um, a lot of, well, some programs have restrictions on accepting folks with those kind of legal charges in the past. Um, and generally having a lower level of motivation for sobriety or a low level of motivation for additional treatment. Um, that's something that's kind of assessed through the interview with the halfway house and the, the individual. So that is some, um, that person may also be, um, you know, may not be accepted into the program. Rules and conduct, so again, certainly will vary from facility to facility, um, and these. this is just an overview. But uh, the primary rule is to maintain sobriety and to participate in any drug and alcohol screenings that are requested. Generally, come back to the facility um, when you are supposed to, whether it's from work, from appointments, or from passes. Uh, no violence, theft, weapons, or contraband. And again, what's considered contraband can vary from facility to facility, but we, the goal is to maintain, you know, a community and a functional environment within the halfway house. Contribute to chores or work details and along those lines, maintain uh, reasonably clean rooms and common areas within the facility attend required programming and support meetings. So that is an important one. If somebody is going to a halfway house program, um, the expectation is that they attend the clinical groups that they need to and other um, programming expectations. And if not, that can result in um, behavioral contracts potentially being asked to to leave the facility. Uh, it's important to keep in mind that Halfway House is a, a treatment program. And lastly, willingness to find employment, volunteer, or other pro-social activities. So usually the expectation is to find employment, but there can be some leeway depending on the, the person's needs. Benefits of a halfway house, um, accountability and structure, we've talked a lot about. Um, there's something to be said about living in a recovery oriented environment with other people who are working to maintain sobriety and make the changes necessary to maintain their sobriety. Practice with building sober supports and practice also with involvement in a recovery community. Halfway houses are affordable. Um, they're usually a state funded facility, so it's generally covered by insurance rather than somebody paying rent, like we'll talk about in a minute with a lot of recovery houses. There is a life skills component and a focus on helping somebody to ultimately live on their own or, you know, in a family setting, but be able to uh, kind of juggle all those different components of early sobriety. And it's an opportunity to continue to address what that person needs clinically through individual and group counseling um, while they are still in a safe environment, but while they're practicing um, increased freedom and increased ability to be out in the community compared to a, a fully residential setting. So I also wanted to touch on recovery houses and sober living houses, three quarter houses, um, because there is a lot of, there can be a lot of confusion between the two. And honestly, the more that I looked into recovery houses and types, categories of recovery houses, um, I 
could understand the confusion um, a bit a bit more because there there is more overlap, I think, than there used to be between the two categories of halfway house versus recovery house. So this is from the National Association for Recovery Res Residences, and now you'll see the overlap. So they kind of break down um, sober living or recovery houses in this way. So there are four levels, um, and the first level is peer run. So usually that is, you know, a substance free recovery house. Um, Oxford houses are a pretty widely known example. So the residents maintain a, a, a culture and community using house rules and peer accountability. Um, they are democratically run, and that is the most characteristic um, component of a, this kind of recovery house. So usually these this is more ideal for somebody who has chosen to live a sober lifestyle. They have more mature life skills. Um, maybe they have a lot of internal motivation to be sober. Um, and these are generally less expensive in term compared to some of the other ones we'll talk about. Level two um, is considered to be monitored. Um, so these are usually called sober homes or sober living. So again, substance free housing. Um, they use house rules and peer accountability. They can are generally run by a senior resident or a house manager. Um, and that is usually somebody who is appointed by the owner of the recovery house or the the operator. And some can provide some recovery support services. So again, house meetings, um, they may have some peer run groups and the expectation is abiding by different house rules. Level three is supervised. So this includes some more structured programming um, and uses peer-based and recovery support services. So um, maybe recovery groups, um, they may help somebody come up with a recovery plan. Um, and there's a bigger focus on life skills development. So again, job readiness, budgeting, those kind of things. Um, so the life skills development is more emphasized and any sort of clinical services are provided outside of the residence. Um, a lot of times staff in these facilities are certified um, and trained, and a lot of them are graduates of a recovery residence themselves. And lastly, uh, level four is, I've seen both integrated and clinical. Um, National Associ Association for Recovery Residences uses clinical now. Um, and that offers a combination of peer and professional staff. So in addition to peer-based recovery supports, um, recovery support services and life skills development, they also offer clinical addiction treatment. So these are usually linked to some kind of clinical facility for referrals and to have the increased involvement of mental health and substance use disorder professionals. So the main piece of this one is that they're usually linked to a different kind of treatment, different level of care. So the overlap hopefully is a lot clearer, but um, in general, both are sober living residences that use drug testing to provide accountability to those that are living there. Um, Halfway houses typically are a bit more consistent with their programming, so they have to co comply with different criteria and different state regulations and federal regulations, whereas recovery houses, the environments can 
very widely. Um, although there is the Department of Drug and Alcohol programs is requiring some recovery houses to be licensed. Um, certainly not all, but that may help to streamline some of the programs and have a little bit more consistency. Um, halfway houses are generally funded by insurance, whereas recovery houses um, generally require rent of some sort from the resident. Although there can be community programs or other resources to help somebody um, when they are first coming into the recovery house. But that depends on the recovery house and different options that might be available in the community. Um, for halfway house, some participation for residents or some residents may be court mandated, whereas residence is totally voluntary at a recovery house. Halfway houses have 24 hour staff and clinical programming, whereas recovery houses have a, a larger focus on peer accountability. Um, they may utilize the house manager and have varying degrees of life skills programming, but generally in, in a lot of circumstances don't have any components of clinical programming. And for halfway houses, the time in the residence can really be dictated by progress and also what the insurance is willing to cover um, or when the insurance feels that somebody is stable enough and could be successful at an even lower level of care or an outpatient level of care. And for a recovery house, the opportunity to reside there for a longer period of time is, is an option um, if the person would like to then they certainly are able to stay in that environment for, you know, nine months, 12 months. Um, really, there's not a limit as long as they're complying by the rules. So only a couple resources for today. Um, the DDAP website, this is just a direct link to finding halfway house programs based on county in the state of Pennsylvania. And this is the website for the National Alliance for Recovery Residences. Um, for a lot of inpatient treatment programs as well, they will have halfway houses that they refer to, but a lot of them also have a list of different recovery houses um, that may be local to them or that they might know of or have um, connected with in the past as well. So usually that's the means that most folks go through used to get placement in certainly in a halfway house, but can also find out about different recovery houses. Um, and DDAP does have the same means of finding a licensed recovery house. It just seems like at this point, a lot of them are few, you know, few and far between. Um, but those are, those are the resources for today. Uh, if you have any questions, if you want to throw them in the Q&A box now. Um, but I am uh, very excited to share that next month our webinar is on August 20th at noon. So our, our usual uh, third Tuesday of the month. Yes, third Tuesday of the month. Um, our topic is going to be about a family recovery approach, which is called Be a Loving Mirror. Um, and our presenter is one of our counselors, Alexis Bentz. So she'll be the one that is facilitating the webinar um, for next month. So I haven't seen any questions come through yet, but um, Otherwise, we'll kind of wrap up here. So thank you very much for your time this afternoon. And again, working with us on the reschedule. Um, and we hope to see you next month at our August webinar. Thank you.